Well, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, It Takes an Organization breakout session that we're having today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the importance of working cross-functionally to drive growth. Um, we've learned how it's no longer one department, and much less one person uh, being required in order to, to help our customers out. So, um, but before we dive into part of that, I wanted to introduce myself and some of our amazing panelists we've got today. Um, in true Gainsight form, we'll do a little icebreaker with our introductions as well. Um, so panelists, before I go into my intro, I'll just say uh, the question is going to be in your professional career, what has been the most memorable experience that you've had? Uh, doesn't have to be the, the monumental, like I got the, I got the job. It could be something as silly as it was the day that I was doing a huge board presentation and my computer died. But I'd love to hear what's been the most exciting kind of memorable thing that's happened to you in your professional life. Um, and I'll let you think about that and I'll, I'll do a quick introduction myself so you're not put too far on the spot there. Um, so my name is John Heinchel. For those of you I haven't met yet, I'm a manager of uh, customer success over at Gainsight. I'm part of our uh, strategic enterprise segment of accounts. Uh, and I'm coming at you live from Atlanta, Georgia today. Um, and for the icebreaker, uh, as mentioned, memorable part of your professional career, I was thinking about it and joking with the panelists yesterday when we were doing a quick tech run through. I was like, it might have been COVID whenever I had to kind of adapt to uh, like Zoom life, being grounded, no more planes, trains, and automobiles. Um, but I was thinking more kind of uh, deeply about it. And I think it's whenever I had in my early 20s, a leader take a huge risk in hiring me and putting me into a different role. And I remember taking a screenshot of my comp adjustment that changed like in one day and it was like 100% different. And I was like, holy cow. And like a child, I called my mom and my dad and was like, y'all, I just mean so, I, I can't believe what just happened. So uh, I will never forget that day. I think I still have this screenshot on my phone. That was years ago at this point. Um, but that's probably my most memorable, the one that kind of comes to mind for being a, a monumentous time in my, my professional career. Um, so Katie, I'll, I'll pass it to you if you want to introduce yourself first and um, just let us know your name, uh, the company you work with and your role there, um, and then the icebreaker. Sure, thanks, John, and I love, I love your career moment. <laughs> that's terrific. Um, so hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Katie Bianchi. I'm the Senior Vice President of Customer Success at Splunk. In my role, I have the honor of leading a thousand amazing customer focused folks across customer success management, renewals, technical support, education and technical enablement, as well as adoption services sales. Um, I think my most memorable career moment, well, first, I think I've been lucky enough um, to have had many memorable career moments uh, throughout my career. But I think the one that really stands out for me was the day that I actually did my first in-person interview with the leadership team at Splunk across customer success and cross-functionally. And I remember going on site and I remember walking into the door of the headquarters and immediately knowing just by feeling that this was a place that I wanted to be. And throughout the rest of the day, the conversations with the team, learning more about the amazing product and technology, but on top of that, what the team was ready to do to drive a huge, huge culture of customer success. Um, and just the fun around the way people were approaching uh, the function and the mission to me was just very memorable. And I, I think about it often. And I have also been lucky enough that that has been true for the last four years that I've been here. So that's my moment. John, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Jane, do you want to uh, do a quick intro of yourself as well? Sure. Yes. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to be a part of this a uh, new event that Gainside is hosting for enterprise organizations. So hello to all of you out there uh, in virtual land. I'm Jane Graham. I'm the Group Vice President of Relationship Management for UKG. Uh, we are a $3.6 billion SaaS software company focused on HR, payroll, workforce management across about 50,000 customers in over 150 countries. Um, and my team is comprised of renewals and relationship management folks, about 500 people strong. Um, and in terms of my memorable moment, 
I was thinking about this last night. I think it, uh, the thing that comes to mind is about a decade ago at the company I used to work for, we were releasing Salesforce to our entire global organization. So big multi-year project. And the company wanted to make a big splash about our go live. And so they asked me and another uh, person on our project team to be a part of a video. So we were filmed dancing, throwing papers, doing all kinds of things around all different parts of our headquarters. And then we laid down a track in our own production studio uh, to Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby. We redid the lyrics. Our project was called Project One. So it was One One Baby. We had verse and everything. And they released that globally on the day we went live to the whole, whole company. And I think Despite my efforts uh, to get the link taken down, I think it's still out there somewhere in uh, in the inner inner space. But I know that Gainsight has a, has a soft spot for videos and parodies and things like that. So maybe that can be a good vintage B roll uh, if I can if, if someone can find it uh, to send it around. So that's mine. I love that. Yeah, it kind of goes along with our little uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure cameo we kind of yeah. had at the beginning of the of, of the kickoff here. Too much fun. Uh, I love that. Margo, I'd love to hear uh, hear from you too. Quick introduction. Thanks, John and Jane. I'm going to look for that video right after this uh, session, <laughs> and I'm sure Katie is too. Uh, I'm Margo Martin. I'm the Group Vice President of Customer Success at Dell Tech. Uh, Dell Tech is the leading provider of um, ERP systems for project-based businesses across the globe. Uh, my team globally is responsible for customer success, renewals, enablement, and adoption um, for all of our products. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah. So what's been the most momentous Oh, I forgot. I forgot yeah, I was so excited about finding your video, you know. So um, <laughs> I would have to say it was five years ago, about five years ago, I was at a conference with my boss and we were just kind of walking down the hall, hanging out. And he's like, oh, I need to talk to you about something. I thought, oh, customer escalation, because I was responsible for global support at that time. And he said, I want you to take over customer success. And I like looked at him like he was completely crazy. And I said, I don't even think I know how to spell customer success. Are you nuts? And uh, that started my wild adventure. And, and here we are today. So it was a good decision on his part and mine, though, I think. I love that. Yeah. It, it always, whenever we in the introduction of customer success, I remember too, whenever people were moving from client advocacy, account management, and we got this new fun title of customer success. And I was like, well, that sounds exciting, right? Yeah. Just to, just to add to that. What point. is that, right? What is that? What's that success all about? So uh, I love that. Um, well, thank you all for being here. I'm super excited about today's discussion. Um, so I, I'm not to just take a sharp turn and delve right into it, but um, I did want to hear some thoughts. I'll kind of throw a question out there. And then um, Jane, I think we, we kind of talked about the, this first one. Um, so we can get your thoughts on that. And then we'll, we can each kind of answer and, and give our, our thoughts on each one of those. So that's kind of how the, the format will be set. Um, but uh, from the participants too that are, that are watching, feel free to add any questions to the chat as well. We'd love to hear you know, what's energizing, what's resonating and what's not too. And we can try to kind of pivot and make sure that we are, we're answering those questions as well. So um, when we do start to think about the post-sales world, post-sale world and how it has evolved even through COVID, much less uh, just whenever we talk about that introduction of customer success from client advocacy, um, what do you feel have, have been the most important decisions you've had to make as a leader now that you're starting to see that it's more than just one person, one department having to, to work with a customer to really help them adopt and expand and, and, and grow? So I'll take the first crack at this and get us started, but very interested to hear Katie and, and Margo's perspective. So, you know, oftentimes I think the most important decisions are, are also the most controversial and, and require the most debate and the most thought. And so as I think about one of the harder you know, conversations and, and decisions that we made uh, was to sort of separate the commercial component specifically around renewing and selling um, back to our customer base from the you know, customer success relationship management function. I think there are um, a lot of pros to having one person that um, sells additional modules and, and add-ons as well as manages that, that renewal conversation. Um, but we found that it was a tall order to ask someone uh, to 
drive adoption, have value utilization conversations, and foster that trusted advisor role, while also working on generating pipeline for next quarter, while also understanding how to pull the right pricing levers and understand the nuances of our enterprise contracts, our mid-market contracts. And so uh, we made the decision to sort of separate the commercial components into specialized renewal role and back-to-base selling role from the uh, the folks that are managing that ongoing relationship and, and adoption, uh, which was a tough decision and, and has a lot of implications for the customer experience and does require now much more synchronization across those groups working with the customer. Um, so that that's the one that comes to mind for me. Yeah, and I can add to that. So our our journey um, for customer su- success and you know kind of breaking down the silos and working with others is a little bit of opposite of what Jane's company did. So we uh, we chose to kind of break away the renewal, just the renewal, and from sales. And so um, sales is still responsible for expansions and add-ons, and they and so it forced us you know with the the you know the back and forth and the and the tug it forced us to really work in partnership with our sales organization like you said jane right where we're where we where we form a team right so while we're responsible for the adoption and ultimately the renewal the sales team is responsible for continuing to expand in that base yeah yeah we did we did something very similar to margo and then i think about well how did we how did we get to the point of making those decisions and i think one of the most important things that we did across our entire go to market organization was really to stop talking about functions and stop talking about pre and post sales and really orient ourselves around the customer journey but to get very clear at a higher level around what strategy what our strategy was and what outcomes we were trying to drive for customers around adoption, value delivery, technical health, et cetera. And and by doing that, right, and by bringing the functional leaders together in a much different way, it became much more clear to us how to make some of the hardest decisions than we had to make and what the guiding principles that we were going to use to sort of make those decisions were because as everybody is talking about these are very big changes that affect large parts of the organization and so to have that alignment and make sure that that alignment is very clear makes the decision making very clear so we made a decision to combine our adopt to renew motion which means that our csm organization sits together in the same function with our renewals organization and we made very clear decisions with our sales organization to say hey you'll you'll run the commercial motion on renewals um, that are over a certain dollar amount, but we want to improve your cost to serve and we want to improve your ability to go out and grow our business. So we are going to add a renewals arm who is going to fully own at this dollar ARR and below, but they will operationally own across our entire portfolio of renewals. And by doing that, we had a value proposition out to our sales team that says, hey, you have help. And you have more time now to go out mm-hmm. and drive growth conversations at accounts while the renewals specialist is really responsible for them partnering super closely with the account team and the CSM to make sure at the end of the day, we had very good signals around renewal risk, right? And we were driving mm-hmm. that process operationally with the right signals, the right visibility, uh, and the right partnership with customers and our sales team. Yeah, I love that. I also love that y'all, everyone kind of had a different approach to the way they handled, I mean, I'll say the age old question is probably not an age old question, but of like, in customer success, who does own upsell? Who does own renewal? I mean, I I hear really compelling cases on both sides of the fence. And Katie, I think the way you articulated it too, is just like a pretty brilliant way to think about things, right? Like you got to think pre-sale, post-sale, but you just customer centric is kind of the most important thing that rings true, right? And that's what helps our customers expand and, and really enjoy our products. Um, it, it kind of feeds into the next question and Katie, not to put you on the spot, but I'd love to hear from you and, 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 and Margo and Jane too on, um, I know shifting to not thinking about pre-post-sale or Jane to, to yours, like to shift away from having CSMs and renewals, like that takes quite a bit of change management. I'd love to hear how either that went, if it went really well, or if you hit some bumps along the way or the routes that you took. Um, Cause I know it's something that's really salient 
especially amongst a lot of enterprise accounts uh, in today's world. Yeah. Um, so I'll start. I'll maybe give two two quick examples, um, and then we'll love obviously Margo and Jane to hear from you as well. But I think if I'm talking, if I sort of go back to the CSM and renewals um, example, the the change management, we actually were very intentional around spending a lot of time there. And we had some really, really strong talent come in and drive that component of change management because it was a radically different approach to coverage for our business. Keeping in mind, we started in an on-prem promise world where the account owner was, was the singular person, right? Responsible for full, full quota around growth in the account. So we made the investment in change management and we spent a lot of time there. And we did it, I think, across two spheres, right? We had to do it across the customer success organization because quite frankly, we were defining a brand new role with net new capabilities. And so we had to be very specific around, well, why are we doing this? And what has changed and what will continue to change? And so while it's a very exciting thing, I think for certain people, it can also be scary because you're completely changing ways of doing things and saying, hey, we need some of the capabilities that we had before, but we need this new level of capability to drive things differently before in terms of what a, what a commercial RSR actually does. And so we spent time there and then we really spent time on with the sales organization. We spent time listening. We spent time taking on board some FUD around the process. We really had to have that sales pitch around this is what you should expect. And then actually we did NPS surveys of our entire sales organization for the first 12 to 15 months that this was in place, where we were basically asking the questions like, what did we tell you you were gonna get out of this? Are you getting that out of it? Are you seeing the benefit? And then what would you do differently? So then through that process, we were sort of course correcting and taking on board the feedback and just making sure that we were tweaking things that weren't going well, but then we were also celebrating the things that were going really well because it was a, a huge and heavy lift for a lot of folks. Um, and then I think on the second side, when you then break down some of those silos and you're starting to build a CSM organization, there can tend to be a lot of confusion between, well, what is the difference between a sales engineer and what is the difference between a CSM mm -hmm. um, and who owns adoption or who owns technical adoption? Um, and are the CSMs technical enough to do the job? And there's 20% the number of CSMs as there are sales engineers. So how does this work when there's not good coverage? And so we actually also had to spend sort of a lot of time on this side of the house as well, getting very clear around the definition of adoption and how the scope of work of a CSM was different, but then also where we have to lean into the technical domain and technical expertise of a sales engineer to actually come in and not just drive new use cases at accounts, but also help when technical adoption in certain instances was, was stalled. And so that was sort of the other side of the complexity that we dealt with on the CSM side mm -hmm. of the house, just in terms of making sure that the outcomes were clear and people's roles were clear um, and that the teams had effective ways of working together. I love that. Love to operationalize. Uh, love that NPS survey. That's a smart way to go about it. <laughs> and Margo and I take a breath at the same time. Margo, you go. Uh, I know we were both like, ah. so I think, um, I think I, you know, you guys took a great approach and I would have learned from that approach. I think um, where we probably had some missteps and I'll talk about that and in, in rolling this out was maybe not cascading the message down far enough, right? We were dealing with like the higher levels at the VP level of our sales leadership, maybe the directors. Um, and then we didn't manage how the process was then rolled further because we, we ran into lots of rules and engagement issues where the salesperson was like, well, no one told me this and I'm telling the customer, I'm their point of contact. Now you're telling the customer, you're their point of contact. So I think messaging has, is key, right? Messaging all the way down to the level and trying to get that buy-in because there is a ton of FUD, what, what Katie said. And, and we also found that we have to have like almost a refresher class every year, kind of in January at like sales kickoff where we remind everybody, you know, how, why we did this and, and, the, and what our goals as a company are to move to, you know, more of a SaaS a company, which this year we now have more SaaS customers than on-premise for the first time ever, which is exciting. Yeah. 
but um, I think the constant reminding and and reshaping and and seeing if the processes still work, see if everybody is still on the same page, and forming a partnership, I think, is really important with the sales mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a whole lot to add. I think you both covered most of the core tenets that have that have worked well for me. I think, you know, finding a sponsor within, in particular, the sales organization that supports the message and can help you think about the audience in a way that will resonate and in, in preempt the you know potential pushback or friction is important. So find someone you trust, someone that is trusted by the sales organization, and and have that person help guide you. I think also two other things, just small things come to mind. One, you know, branding something, branding an initiative can, can oftentimes help create yeah. clarity and structure around what you're doing and why you're doing it. When people have, have you know, a name for something, I think oftentimes it can help, help clear confusion and, and, and provide a forum in which to talk about some of these things without, without it getting too um, complicated. So that's a second item. Um, and then, I think third, you know, find a couple win stories, you know, it's particular for renewals. There's oftentimes scenarios where the sales rep or fill in the blank was grateful to have the help and expertise of a team that does this every day, all day, and can bring that, that muscle to the table to provide some context. And so find a couple of those, memorialize them, share them across different parts of the organization to just support why this is good for the customer and why this can be good for for the, the core other teams so a couple other things but otherwise katie and, and margo nailed it yeah no i love that too i think always having a name to something makes it a little bit more important right it's not so in the air you can't it's intangible seemingly so whenever you've got a good brand and i also love a success story give a verified outcome right to to the internal teams just like uh just like katie you mentioned with the nps surveys for the internal teams right like we can think of our customers, we can think about our internal stakeholders kind of in the same vein at times. Um, so I, I love all of that. Um, we, we talked a little bit about this, but I'd also love to hear too, um, information sharing. So typically in, you know, in the same kind of customer success silo, a lot of CS information stays in the CS world or in the CS department. And it's sometimes harder to get around to either sales or to marketing or support. I'd love to hear how um, you've approached that in, in different ways, either through your, your tech stack or just in general, how you're kind of doing, it can be something as specific as like sales, uh, pre-sale to post-sale handoffs, but even more so just in general, how are you sharing information about what's going on and frankly, what used to be a silo and now is kind of supposed to be more about a company-wide initiative. I don't know if anyone wants to, to take the buck on that one first. Oh, we have so much work to do in this area. So it's hard for me to say, here are the great things we're doing. <laughs> it's so hard. It's and, hard. Yeah. Okay. You know, UKG is in a position where, you know, uh, two years ago, we announced a merger of Ultimate Software and Kronos Incorporated. So two companies about the same size, 6,000 6, employees, 1.2 billion in revenue each. And we're merging the systems, we're merging the teams. And so it's never been more important to communicate and provide transparency and create those channels for communication. But we had two different Salesforce instances, two different gain side instances. And so um, it has been you know, difficult. We'd have, we've had to, to get creative and really get specific about the things that are most important, the most salient parts of the customer journey to ensure we have alignment across teams on. And so um, I don't have a, a good example of, of, of what we're doing today, but I do think um, our conversations about how we're merging our systems and how we're bringing these, these um, organizations together in a way that provides that clarity um, has highlighted for me even some of the things that, that we should have been tackling um, prior to, to the merger. And I think, um, you know, the, the handoff from the implementation team to the you know, organizations that will now make sure that customer is successful for years and years to come is probably one of the most important you know, parts of the, of the journey. And so we're working to create you know, uh, knowledge transfer documents and meetings within our, our services organization uh, that will 
provide con the right context to the support organization, that will provide the right context to my organization that closes the loop with the sales person that says we've successfully moved this customer into, um, into a live status. And, um, and so I think that's one of the things that we're, we're working on, but, but my goodness, we're not, we're not quite there yet, for sure. I think I'll, I'll, I'll share ahead, a Katie. couple. Oh, no, you first. Okay, I'll go. Okay, so um, I'll share a couple things. And Jane, I think what you guys have done is really impressive, even on that cross sharing of knowledge. I think that's something that many companies really, really struggle with because it's deep knowledge that has to get transferred, like function to to function. Um, I'll share a couple of examples and, and challenges, and I don't pretend to have the right recipe uh, at all because, as Jane says, like I work in a data company and it is complex. And I think the things that have made it a little bit more complex for us, just organizationally, is number one, the renewal rate calculation in a recurring revenue business is complex for people to understand. Even the smartest people in the world, right? We spend so much time on it, and it even it as it changes and evolves. Number like we have to keep up with it, right? So expecting the entire organization to understand how a recurring revenue walk works as we have changed and evolved has been um, has been a challenge for us. And then I think at the same time as we built up our CSM organization, we were I would sort of characterize it as putting the wheels on the plane at the same time that we were trying to fly. We were hiring a ton of people. And we were trying to decide well what is good enough to start to get to full coverage and start to understand where our customers are on their adoption journey. And so we made some decisions, what I would call sort of good enough decisions around how to run the business through Gainsight. And what we're learning now is that we sort of have to start fresh in certain ways to actually get the data and telemetry that we really need to run the business much more effectively. But what we have been, like what we have been doing through all of this is I would say a couple of things. We're trying to open up Gainsight as much as possible to other functions. We surface it in Salesforce and allow the sales team to see full point of view. We um, have our support team. We have other functions that use Gainsight to execute end-to-end -end journey orchestration. And then we're setting up business mechanisms where on a weekly basis almost, we are surfacing the risks themes at a higher level that come out of Gainsight across our sales organization and across our products and technology organizations. So we're figuring out ways to marry the backwards view of, of churn, right, with a forward view of risk, and then come back to the organization, which is our responsibility, and say, hey, thematically, here are the three things that we see. And certainly, we've got, we've got to address things at a customer level, but as a leadership organization across the organization, then we have to use this data to actually inform how we're going to prioritize major changes in order to prevent churn and help accelerate adoption moving forward. And that becomes a combination of what we get as qualitative intel from our CSM organization and our RSR organization, but then all the telemetry that we're pulling in to gain sight from our cloud customers. Love that. Yeah. Because frankly, right, all of that leads to to growth of an account. You know, like that is what that is that growth generator. Margo, I'd love to get your thoughts too. Sure. So you know, they covered a lot of it, but um, I would say one thing that we've really focused on is what Katie mentioned: is almost the definitions of NRR, GRR, mm -hmm. churn by units, churn by dollars. Um, we actually. And even educating my colleagues on the executive team, right? They didn't, they didn't really understand that. So we lead with the definitions and now they're in the appendix of all of our decks so people can go and, and, um, and understand that. I think that was really important was educating them because they, they just didn't understand the nuances. And then we also hold, um, we call them key internal key stakeholder meetings on a quarterly basis by product where customer success is sharing and the, the information that we have. So renewal rates, churn, um, how many customers we've onboarded, onboarding surveys, um, um, health score, right? Now everybody wants in gain site. We've been buying viewer licenses now. So, right, to get them back into Salesforce because now they're very curious, which is exciting. They want the information. Um, we also review net promoter and loyalty and improvements in those meetings as well. So we do that on a quarterly basis by product. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I love that too. Like, frankly, not to 
quote Julie Andrews and Sound of Music, but sometimes you got to start at the very beginning. It's a really great place to start, right? Like just defining some of these metrics that are, <laughs> you know, especially when you're moving from an on-prem to subscription base, from service packages to just, a, you know, um, a, a, an actual SaaS type uh, contract, right? Like people don't always just have a clear understanding of what ARR, TCV, NRR, NDR, we've got so many acronyms in customer success or CS, right? So I, I love that. Like, don't try not to overcomplicate some things. Like the first step in being able to share some information is just aligning on what information actually is that's going to be important, important to the to the customers and to your internal stakeholders as well. Um, kind of in that same vein, I did. We got a specific question too about um, would lo people loving to understand specifically whenever you have a CS and a sales or commercials a counterpart how do you do, what are those plans looking like to grow a specific customer? Do you have specific playbooks that you run? Is it, um, hey, here's a CSQL type opportunity? I'd love to hear, um, like whenever there is an expansion op or there is a, a, an opportunity for the account to just to grow even just organically, um, how is that passed along and what does that CS and sales relationship look like? And that's open to, to anyone who is ready to take a bite. I'll go first on this one. So we've been really focused on this the last few years. Um, we centralized our enterprise customers under one leader in my organization. And um, I think that's where we get even more pull and tug from sales sometimes is at that level because they knew so much in the pre-sell and they've, they've been working on these customers for years, right? And they've built this relationship and they're terrified you're gonna your new enterprise csm is going to just wreck it in the first you know 30 days so um we have really leaned into the leadership there ensuring them that we're not trying to take your job we're not trying to eliminate your position right it takes a it takes a village to support these large enterprise customers and what does that look like so um we've found we meet with them frequently um and at an almost at an individual level so We'll take the account executive and we'll take the enterprise DSMs and you know put them to meetings either weekly or bi-weekly to walk through the customers to understand, oh, did they mentioned expansion to you. Oh, they mentioned it to me too. And how are we going to partner to work on this together? So we've just found you have to just really work very closely together. Gain site access and and was really important at that level too, because you want to make sure that if you had a conversation that the account executive also is aware of that conversation and vice versa. Yeah. Good. I would say two things along, along this line, a lot, lot of other items, but the two that come to mind, um, one, our CSMs, we call them ERMs, executive relationship managers are responsible for creating a 12 month or up to 24 month account plan for all of their accounts. And, um, they build that both internally with uh, the stakeholders that are a part of that account team across our technical support organization and the, the sales representative, um, as well as sort of getting it ratified with the customer that mm -hmm. here are the touch points that we are going to um, focus on operationally over the next 12 months. And then here are the two times over the next 12 months where we're going to pick our heads up out of the sand and we're going to talk about strategy and what the next three years look like. And we expect the different people from your organization to be at each of those touch points. Before we get to the, the customer step, we sit down with the sales organization and say, what do you, what are your plans for this account? How can I incorporate your agenda into what I put in front of the customer? Which meetings do you want to be invited to to plant the seed for expansion A or expansion B? How involved do you want to be? And it differs across the spectrum of where that customer is in their journey. And, and it's really important to Margo's point that we have that alignment with the, the other people that are interfacing with that account. And it helps to kind of focus on a 12 month window to say, here's what we're trying to accomplish with the customer. Here's what the customer is telling us they're trying to accomplish. And how do we bring it all into uh, a sort of overarching plan? In addition to that, we do have a lead program in a, a, a payout for, for closed leads that are sourced by the ERM team. So we do promote that behavior and that deep collaboration and, um, and reward them when, when an, an identified opportunity does close. Yeah. And I think what Jane has said is so important that you have to flex and be clear around where a customer is on their journey. 
and make and make sure that you're applying the right resources and the right support for that customer at the right time. Um, and so I would just echo that we tried to get very clear on, for instance, the service catalog of a customer success manager versus a regional sales manager versus a sales engineer. And at the end of the day, we pay our CSMs on retention rate and net dollar retention. But the, the, the place in which they operate is to say you are responsible for full adoption, full value delivery, and full capability and COE build for a customer to get to value on what they have purchased. And the faster you do that, the faster they are ready to bring more use cases onto the platform. And it becomes a really logical handoff because that sort of holy trinity of folks then say, okay, well, we're, we're working towards this from a three-year perspective and now we're ready. And it becomes a very clear handoff back to the sort of the sales engineer who will then pick up the execution of incremental um, use cases. But I, I think what Jane said is so important that the teams can't, they always have to be glued together. And sometimes the glue is a little stronger than others, just depending on where a customer is on the journey. And the more that we can do to create customer success plans and have a singular account plan that everybody is operating off of, the more seamless and fast I, I've seen things go. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, I think it's a myriad of, of everything that y'all have said too, right? It's like, everyone's kind of doing the same motion, but maybe with using different tools in their toolbox to do those. I mean, it's typically clean communication with the commercials counterpart and, you know, with the others that would be involved in that upsell. And, you know, do you want your CSM to be seen as someone who is doing planting that seed? I can't remember who mentioned that, but I liked that. Or do you want it to be maybe an account executive or someone who um, is more, you know, streamlined to the commercials to, to be that person? So the CSM or, you know, whatever title we'd like to use is the one that's not having to do that pitch, but knows it's the perfect opportunity for it. So uh, we do something similar at Gainsight. It's account planning. We do the CSQL process as well. So um, yeah, I, I love hearing all of that, uh, hearing all of that as well. Um, I would love to talk more about, um, I think Jane, you brought up m and I think mean, that's a huge thing that's going on in so many uh, accounts and companies. Um, and then also Katie, you brought up something also super interesting, which is you have so many people that could have, have access to accounts. Like, how do you streamline all of those things into making sure that a customer is not getting talked to too much? But unfortunately, we only have seven minutes left, <laughs> and I want to keep talking about all of these things. <laughs> um, so I will say, just in the in the sake of time, um, maybe we'll just do one one more question. I hate that I just gave that teaser because those are just two things that are so near and dear to enterprise accounts right now, I think. But um, next time, John, right? Next time. Next time. Next unplugged, we'll do that. But um, I'd love to hear, I'm sure the group too would love to hear too. Um, and, and looking back, if you could go back in time and kind of tell yourself a little tip um, before, you know, before customer success was such a, a title and before we had to work so cross-functionally with other teams for our customers, um, what would be the little tidbit of advice that you would give yourself if you could go back in time and, and, and give yourself some advice? I'm not going first. I'm <laughs> not either. Uh -oh. oh, Katie's <laughs> last. Katie, you're last. <laughs> oh, that's, such, that's, that's such a good question. Um, it's so hard because we're taught not to regret, right? Yeah. Um, no, I think, <laughs> I think, you know, I, 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 I sort of touched on this a little bit before, and I think as a leader, as fast paced as things are, are some of the hardest decisions you make are between what's good enough to run the business at any given point in time. And then how do you actually build for scale and repeatability? Um, I, I will never, never pretend I'm ever getting any of those decisions right on a day to day basis. But I think what I what if if sort of I had the way, way back machine, I think we would have spent a little bit more time um, as we built the adopt to renew function and really investing around CS operations, uh, a lot more around CS operations, CS process quality. Mm -hmm. um, and asking ourselves, where do we want to be in three years? And how do we set up capable process, capable systems, capable operating discipline and cadence would probably be um, the thing that we would have spent, we would have spent more time 
on, right? Because at the end of the day, CS is becoming so, we're be like, it's becoming such a critical and important function that you actually, like, you have to be as good, if not better than traditional sales ops and rev ops organizations, right? Who, who tend to be heavily invested in um, and spend the time and spend the resources building up all of those capabilities around it. So I think that would be my, my number one uh, continuous improvement <laughs> item I'd yeah. take on board. Well, yeah. you strike Loved me as to, very- I can't wait to hear from- uh, yeah, You bought us some time, <laughs> so thanks. I've, I've got mine now, but uh, you, you strike me as very operationally excellent. So I imagine what you put, put, put forward is, is definitely good enough, um, but that, that's a good one. And that's a good one to kind of think about even moving forward. I think for me, maybe two things. Um, one, I'm a big proponent for CS leaders having deep relationships with uh, the finance department, and in particular, uh, your CFO. And so, you know, I think if I were to go back, I would have you know, invested even more time in making sure that what I was trying to accomplish and the metrics I'm using and the way I'm building my team is aligned with the financial goals of the company and that I can speak to our P&L and our revenue performance and tie it directly back to our initiatives. And so I think that's that's one. And then the second, I, I think oftentimes we uh, minimize the importance of those small follow-up side conversations with folks in other departments after a meeting where maybe there was a debate or maybe there was some friction or maybe a decision was reached where you notice that someone maybe had something more to say or or maybe disagreed in um, in some way with, with your position, picking up the phone for the five minutes after that meeting and calling that person and saying, hey, um, what do you think about that meeting? Oftentimes, I think if I had done that more earlier on, I would have been able to drive uh, you know, change in a, in a different way, uh, maybe even more quickly um, by kind of saying the things that go unsaid or allowing um, things to be said that would have gone unsaid. So those are my two. Oh, those are both really good. So I have to follow up now. So um, I think what I would have told my younger self was to to really create the mission, right? Almost a mission statement, a slogan, something to get and to remind everybody why we were doing this. Because I think, you know, we kind of rolled out customer success and then enterprise and, and we did things very quickly um, because we, we buy a lot of companies too, right? So we're constantly in that mode. But I think if we would have had like a rally cry or a mission right at the beginning that everybody knew the goal was to move as many customers as possible from on-premise to SaaS and to make them happy and to explain stickiness and adoption and engagement, um, that we could go back to and point to and say, no, this is why, remember, this is why we're doing this. I think, I think we, we were too focused on quick and speed and getting it done and kind of rolling something out. And I think if we had taken a step back to educate all of our stakeholders about what we were trying to accomplish and why, the importance of the why, I think is really important on that. So I would have told myself that and to focus on the customer experience like really quickly and then revisit it constantly, right? I mean, you can do, you did journey mapping seven years ago and then kind of did some 2.0 last year and realized that oh, implemented just kind of fell on the wayside or onto that, you know, got torn up on the on the floor. And, but we thought it was still, you know, continuing that way and we had this great journey. So I think you can't just do journey and customer experience like once and call it a day. It's something you constantly have to evolve. Yeah, I'm scribbling down notes because I'm just like, I, all of these I things are so salient. I'm just like, oh, I've got my pen. I'm sure our proctor's like, John, please don't be writing during this session. But I can hear you scribbling. I wrote them, yeah, I'm writing a lot down. But um, yeah, I think for, for everyone listening, I mean, my the notes that I wrote down, uh, CS operations, don't, don't second guess it. It's so important. Have that relationship with finance and understand that. Uh, make sure you can have those candid, I think Brene Brown calls them rumbles, where you can have a kind of a conversation with somebody, even if it's a little uncomfortable to make progress. And then, you know, Margaret, to your point too, like, you know, have that rally cry, make sure that you're out there, uh, people understand what's going on, what the importance of it all is, and really uh, not to use something that we used like three years ago, but really transform, you know, a company into a customer success company versus just being a company who's there for, you know, other things. Like we've gone are the days where we could just kind of 
live that life. Like customer experience has to be at the forefront now because there's so many options for people to go to. So um, I want to thank you all for your time today. It's been super valuable. Um, and for those that are listening, if you have any questions, I'm sure everyone on this panel will be happy to connect. So LinkedIn us. Uh, if you have any other questions we didn't get to answer, please let me know and we'd be happy to get back to you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Thank you Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Margo. See, See ya. ya.